join me in welcoming Leon. Thank you. So just, just to give me a, a sense of who you are, uh, how many of you are engineering students? Okay, good. Are there any faculty in here? One, two. Okay, that's too bad. They're the ones who are most in need of education, so um, anyway. I'm going to talk about something that is of burning interest to me, and you can tell it's of burning interest because I retired about six years ago. I gave up a chaired professorship and retired and came back half time, and this stuff is pretty much what I work on all the time. So I'm still working here at Georgia Tech, even though I'm officially retired. I'm going to talk about smart machines and smart supply chains, but I'm not going to talk about what we, too much about what we can do, what we do know. I'm going to try and talk a little bit about where the gaps are. Um, not that we don't have smart machines and not that we aren't making factories and supply chains smarter and smarter, um, but there's some real gaps. And we need to identify who's going to be responsible for filling those gaps. Um, so these are my goals for today. Try to think about what SMART means in the context of what most of you are doing here in the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute. Talk about some successes and opportunities and what this all means. Okay, so let's start off with what does it mean to be smart? Is a chisel smart? What do you think? Let's see, how many think a chisel's smart? How many think a chisel's not smart? How many are too busy eating? <laughs> so chisel's not smart. Um, chainsaw, is a chainsaw smart? What do you, chainsaw smart? Chainsaw is a lot stronger than a person. It's a lot faster than a person, but it's not smart. Um, how about a CNC router that can produce a work of art in an hour? Is that smart? Smart. Why would you say it's smart? What makes it smart? It's fast. It's repeatable. But is it smart? In the way that those of you who have children or who have been children think of children as being smart. So is, is a CNC router smart? I would say it's not. It's not smart. It makes zero decisions. It follows a script. If you don't tell it what to do, it's just going to sit there. So I don't think of it as smart. Um, and if you tell it to do something stupid, like run right across the middle of that dragon without picking up the router bit, it'll ruin it. So it's not very smart. It's fast. It's economical. It's repeatable. It's reliable. It's a lot of good things, but it's not smart. How about this lift truck? Is this lift truck smart? I would say, yeah. It's smart in a dumb kind of way because it will refuse to pick up something that will cause it to turn over. It makes a decision to not do something. So that makes it smart in a very limited kind of a way. This overhead transport system that's moving lots of product around in a wafer fab is like, it's like a big city taxi system. You call it up and say, I want you to pick me up at, at station 27 and drop me off at station 198. And it'll come get you. And it'll manage all of those transporters while it's doing all of that. That's pretty smart. It's making decisions. You may not even be able to predict how it's going to do what it's going to do. So it's smart in a somewhat mysterious kind of way. But it's smart because it makes decisions. So 
one of the things that I would use to try and distinguish between smart and not smart is, does it make decisions? And not just any kind of decisions, but if we're going to think about things that are really smart, we want to think about it makes good decisions and it does it reliably, that it exhibits the behavior you expect or want it to, behave, to, to exhibit, and it does it correctly. It's predictable. There's got all these good things. And maybe down at the bottom, we could even say it learns, although the, the population of smart learning systems in factories and supply chains is still somewhat limited. Now, I want to talk about smart systems in the context of the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute. And a big part of the kinds of systems that are, are of interest in the Supply Chain and Logistics Institute are what I have come to call discrete event logistics systems. Discrete event logistics systems are, it's, it's a very large class of, of systems. And they're systems that are that can be characterized this way. There's something moving through the system and its value is being increased. It moves between a network of identifiable resources. Thank you. And when it reaches one of those resources, something gets done to it. The resources transform it in some way. They move it from point A to B. They hold it for a while while it gets older. They change its properties. They take material off of it. They add material to it. They paint it. They, they heat treat it, whatever. And they maybe even collect information about it. So transformations are executed by resources that are organized in a network, and stuff flows through this network. So that's, that's what I would call a discrete event logistics system. And there are a lot of them. Every warehouse is a discrete event logistics system. Every factory every supply chain. Uh, hospitals can be thought of as discrete event logistics systems because patients move through hospitals. They have things done to them that change their properties or change what we know about them. So the world is full of these discrete event logistics systems and if we can figure out how to make these things smart, we've really accomplished something. <coughs> okay, so they're ubiquitous. Um, now, how do we measure smart? How do you measure smartness? In the context that we're interested, how do you measure smartness? Well, you, sm you measure the degree of smartness by the output. Does making this system smart make its output better, cheaper, faster? How does it, how does it improve the output? It's not measured by input. It's not really measured by the technologies that you use. It shouldn't be. It should be measured by the results of using those technologies. And for, for me, it's decision making is a real central part of this. If we're not making, if our smart systems aren't making decisions, then they're not doing what we really want them to do. So in the context of Dells, these discrete event logistics systems, we might think about making these things smart at different levels. We might think about making them smart down at the process level, where the transformations are taking place. We might think about making them smart at the operational level, where we're trying to coordinate lots of different processes. We might think about making them smart at the planning level, where we're trying to figure out for a week or a month, what do we want to do? And we might think about making them smart at the design level, of designing systems that are going to be smart and, uh, and accomplish all the things that we want them to accomplish by being smart. So I want to look at them in these sort of four different levels. Actually, I'll only do three. I'm going to start off with process level smartness. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because this is not the part of this that's really of interest to me. What have some other people said about smart machines? Schneider Electric, yeah, they're a pretty good sized company. We ought to pay attention to what they say. Here's what they say constitutes smart technologies. Notice what's missing in here. What do you think is missing in this list that I have indicated to you I would care about? Decision making. There's nothing in here about decision making. So 
this, this kind of smart technology is not bad stuff because what does it do? It makes things faster. If you can communicate digitally across a factory, then you don't have to have paper that gets filled out in one place and goes somewhere else and gets handled and goes somewhere else and gets handled and finally turns into some action. Things can happen really fast. You can have data displays that pull together data from all over the factory and now show you things that in the past you could never have seen because it would have been too expensive to get all that data together and turn it into information that made sense to you. So these technologies are, are really good, but they're not decision-making technologies. Um, top five automotive robotic applications. Interesting stuff. What's missing? Decision-making, that's right. The decision-making that you find in here is decision-making about, oh, this bottle is, is not where I think where it's supposed to be, but I can get it. It's that kind of decision making. It's not decision making of where there are really choices that make a difference. So contemporary smart machines are, are really good at sort of limited tasks. They're not making a lot of decisions. Now, that's changing. Last year I was in Taiwan for a couple of meetings and uh, a fellow that I've known for a long time, Chen Fu Chen, works for Taiwan Semiconductor and they have done some really amazing things there. They are the world's leader in cycle time reduction. In semiconductor manufacturing, it, traditionally the, it's been the case that you take these very expensive wafers, you've spent a lot of money on them, you run them through a manufacturing process and because there's a lot of variability in the process, you take one of those wafers off and you test it to figure out if it's ready to go to the next step or do we have to rework this wafer. And so the testing takes time, there's a delay, and then if you have to rework, of course, there's time to do the, re the rework, and so cycle times are really long. Here's what, what TSMC did. They basically said, you know, we can collect a lot of information from our process equipment. By the time a wafer gets through our fab, we will have a million data points. I want you to think about that. They might have four or 5,000 lots in process at one time. Each lot might be 20 wafers. Now think about the amount of data that they're collecting on an hourly basis about the processes that they're executing. So they went from having process engineers trying to figure out how these process tools are working to employing a bunch of data scientists, people who are experts in AI and, and data science. And they've basically transformed their business because what they've done is they've figured out how to run the processes so that they don't have so much variability or if they do, they know how to deal with it and now they can just send the wafers from one process to the next. They don't test them. They don't have any rework. It's made a huge difference in, in, their, in their business. Um, and, and I wanted to show this because I want to explain essentially what's going on because I think it's important. They're improving the process. Well, process control in, in that business or in any business, process control is a really traditional topic I, mean, I, I probably should have learned this when I was an undergraduate. So I know it's been taught for a long time how to control processes. And there's, there's a couple of really important parts of this. There is, <laughs> okay, um, there's the controller model and there's the plant model. And the way this works is you tune the parameters on the controller until you get the behavior that you want from the plant. It means that you have a model of the plant. So this is all classical stuff, really well understood. Now, here's where the, the aha happened at TSMC. What they said was, you know, we don't have a very good process model. 
we collect a bunch of data and we archive it and, and then we calculate some statistics and we'll build some statistical models and that becomes our model of the process. And they said, wait a minute, we're collecting a million data points on every wafer that we send through the factory. We're not really using the data very effectively. So they got their data scientists to work and they created much better process models. They didn't really change this part all that much, but they changed this part. This is the part that had been missing. That is, we're so fascinated by our ability to do the mathematical gymnastics associated with control theory, we kind of forgot or lost sight of, hey, we need good process models too. And so they've really taken advantage of that. Um, so my opinion on smart processes is we don't necessarily have a lot of those yet, but it's coming and the technology is now pretty well understood. The opportunities are for building much better process models and then deploying the control technology that we already know how to do. What does that mean? Well, there's some implications for what we ought to teach, um, what we ought to be doing research on, and what what practitioners ought to be doing. Um, and so I, you can read that. I'm not going to belabor the point. What I want to do is I want to go to how do we take those ideas and, and build on them to, do, to make our, our operations smart. So if you look at any factory or any supply chain, again, you see this network of resources. And what's interesting about these resources is they don't operate continuously. There's no such thing as steady state. Um, they're doing something now, they stop and start doing something completely different 10 minutes from now. So it's a very chaotic environment if you think of it that way. So you might want to think, well, uh, what's the plant model? What is the plant model for this? That's a, that's a depressing question because it has a depressing answer. We don't have a plant model. We have analysis models. We know how to build queuing models. We know how to build simulation models. We know how to build optimization models. But we don't really know how to build plant models for this factory in the same sense that we know how to build plant models for a device. We don't have a model for which we can say, this is the input and this is the output. And here's how that happens. Here's how this black box, this plant, transforms the input to the output. Because if you don't understand that, it's going to be pretty hard to design a control system for it. So we have a real challenge here. We don't have a standard unified controller agnostic representation of the plant. And that presents a real challenge for people who want to design controllers or people who want to test controllers. It's a huge challenge. Um, and if you doubt that, I'll, I can show you some models that we're working on now that will test your uh, patience. Well, what about control? We don't have a very good plant model. Do we have a good control theory? And the answer is, no, we don't. We don't have a good control theory. What we have, the best thing that we have today, is the ISA 95 standard. And what the ISA 95 standard does is that it's, it gives you a functional requirement for what is called in the ISA 95 a level two controller. And level two control is basically what bridges between things like production planning and down here things like executing processes on machines. That level three is the management of operations that are taking place across a set of machines that are interacting in some way. So we don't really have a good control model. We have a functional model, but we don't have a control theory per se. And the functional model basically says these are the functions that have to be performed if you're going to do level three control. Doesn't say how to do it, and so everybody does it in an ad hoc way. 
there's no theory. So you got to do it in an ad hoc way. I'm not saying that's bad. There are people who are really good at this. Uh, it's just that it's the reality that it's ad hoc. So what we're missing is, A, we're missing a plant model. We're missing the ability to construct a plant model that explains how the input becomes the output and has a precisely defined interface. Because when you think back to the device control, there's a precisely defined interf interface between the controller and the plant. And we're also missing, well, okay. But we have the ability to start changing that. One of the things that we've been doing in my lab is trying to evolve um, an ontology and some semantics for describing these kinds of systems. And if you're going to do that, you have to be very precise about what is the product, what is a process, what is a resource, and how are processes authorized? Because the authorization has to come from a controller, and the controller is making decisions. So we do have a, a start on something like this. The other thing we're missing is a theory of control. We don't have a theory of control if we had a theory of control, it would, at a minimum, it would make clear what are the decisions that, be, that are being made. What is a control decision? And, at a minimum, we'd know what triggers a control decision, because these are discrete event systems. Um, we need a framework. Well, one of my PhD students, who's now at NIST, proposed the following framework. After reading hundreds and, per, and looking at perhaps thousands of research papers in the literature, Tim Sprock said there are essentially five types of operational control decisions. And every research paper that you find that claims to do something around operational control is addressing one or more of these five decisions. The first decision is, am I going to do it or not? Someone offers me a job and I say, no, can't do it. So it's acceptance. One of the decisions is assigning resources. Where am I going to do it? What resource am I going to use to do it? One of the decisions is sequencing or scheduling, deciding when to do it. One of the decisions is routing. Where does it go next? And one of the decision types is when do I want to change the state of a resource to do a changeover? a setup. And his claim is, if you take those five kinds of decisions, that covers everything that's ever been written about operational control. And so far, we haven't found a counterexample. So that's a pretty good start at a framework for a control theory for operations. There are five kinds of decisions. The other part of this is that a, what is the structure of a controller? And so the proposal that we're working from right now is that a controller has these five, these six components. It monitors events. When an event occurs for this discrete event logistics system, it says, do I need to make a decision? If so, what kind of decision? And then it says, okay, how am I going to make that decision? Um, if there is a problem to be solved, an analysis to be done in order to guide that decision, then we have to formulate the analysis, we have to do the analysis, and then we have to interpret the analysis into something that is, in fact, executable. We can create a task and give it to one of the resources to authorize it to do something. So we have a framework. It's not a total theory, but at least it's a way of explaining, here's what we think we can observe in the factory. It works like this. So it's a theory about how control works in discrete event logistics systems. Um, now, there's a, 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 an interesting gotcha here, which goes like this. In manufacturing, what you usually get if you're, if you're producing a product is you get a bill of materials 
and you get a process plan that says, here are the steps to go through to make this product. And so that's what you follow. You follow the process plan. If it says, first you, you cut this material, then you grind a face, then you bore some holes, then you heat treat it, then you paint it, you, that's the process plan. What the process plan does, and, and so if you're following that process plan, that part could be not so hard. Because when you finish doing one step, you look around and see, okay, is it time to do the next step? Here's what's kind of not talked about very much. Stuff doesn't get from the cutoff saw to the mill by magic. Something has to move it. So every time there's a transfer of material in the factory, in the hospital, in the supply chain, some resource has to be directed to do it. But that step isn't specified a priori. That task, that command has to be created by the control system. That creates some real requirements that are, that are non-trivial, which means the control system has to understand what is the network of resources, who's connected to who. And if I want to move something from this resource to this resource, what are my options? Got to know that. And then I've got to be able to direct one of those resources to actually do the movement. Now, I'm going to throw something in here that I thought I wasn't going to do, but I'm going to do it anyway, uh, just to see if anybody will bite. Um, we spend a lot of time in our education learning about cues and cueing theory, about how to manage cues. And the only cues that actually occur in manufacturing are ones that can't be controlled. <coughs> and the ones that can be controlled are not cues. So I want you to think about that for a little bit. Um, now, so what I wanted to say here, because we're missing all this stuff uh, that would let us make smart operations management, that seems to fly in the face of a lot of, um, of promotional material and advertising and marketing that you'll see about, about the digital thread. Who's not heard about the digital thread? Okay, well, uh, Google that. Digital thread, it's gonna save the world. It's how we're tying together all the information associated with products. Uh, you'll read a lot about digital twins. We're building computational models that reflect what's really going on, say with a piece of equipment or with an airplane. Um, you'll read about the brilliant factory. We're making it brilliant. I guess brilliant must be better than smart. Um, and then smart supply chains. And so I'm not saying that all this advertising is, is not true. What I think is worth keeping in mind is that we don't yet have a theory for how to manage operations, and we don't have a way to specify precisely the network of resources over which these operations are being executed, and therefore the decision-making capability that's built into any of these solutions is largely ad hoc. Not bad. Not bad, but ad hoc. And so there's some implications. Um, those of us who do research in this area might want to spend a little bit of effort thinking about how the problems that we analyze turn into uh, tasks that can be executed in the discrete event logistics system. In terms of teaching, one of the things that I've discovered um, is that we do a really good job of teaching analysis. We do a somewhat less good job of making sure that people appreciate the limits of analysis. The, the distortion that analytic modeling can introduce when you're talking about a warehouse, a factory, or a supply chain. And in terms of practice, I would advise people to be smart about how they buy smart systems. Um, if there's decision making, it's a lot harder to understand exactly how the decisions are made. 
and therefore it's, it's a lot harder to understand how that can go wrong. And if you're unsure about that kind of statement, read up on Tesla about what can go wrong when decision making is done in a way that you don't completely understand. Like Tesla cars running into the back of fire trucks that are trying to save a motorcycle driver who's down. Now, I want to talk about design. Finish up with design. For four or five years now, I've worked with a guy at Boeing. Um, this guy, Adam. Adam has a job. He runs a simulation team, and they basically do production analytics. They build simulation models to support people who are either designing or improving the design of aircraft factories. And the way that Adam's life works is there are people designing the airplane. They live in a pristine environment, and their design in different stages comes over the wall, through the transom, as they used to say, comes over the wall, and now the people who are supposed to be developing the production system go to work on it. And there's a number of stakeholders here. There's someone who's responsible for production design, figuring out how we're going to do it. Um, there's, and this is a simplified view. There's someone who's responsible for deciding what the work instructions will look like. How are we actually going to do each one of the operations that needs to be done? And then down here is someone who's doing production analytics, predicting how this system is going to work. Um, there's a lot of information flowing around here, obviously. You have a bill of materials that comes over in terms of the aircraft design. And someone's got to turn that engineering bill of materials into a manufacturing bill of materials, and someone has to figure out, you know, how are we going to produce each of the parts, what are the resources are going to be that we're going to buy, put it all together and predict how it's going to work. And oh, by the way, when they start on this program, let's say you're talking about a wing for a new airplane, they may not know how many struts or how many spars or how many stringers this wing is going to have. So they'll start with, well, we're going to have a set of stringers. How many? Well, we don't know yet. Okay. I got to build a model that will predict how this factory will perform, that will let us do things like estimate how many autoclaves we have to buy, because that's a really big, expensive, long lead time piece of equipment. So you know how they do this? Do you know how they exchange this critical information that's going to go into the analysis? Do you have any idea how they do that? Because over here, these people are using 3D CAD programs and data management systems and systems engineering. I mean, they, they are tooled up. You know how these guys are doing it? Pictures. Pictures and spreadsheets. It's not even formal pictures, it's PowerPoint. This is the state of the art. Now, that's pretty depressing. For me, I mean, I've been in this business for whew, about, I'm not going to tell you how long. Um, and so the advantage that we've got, the advance over when I, when I started, and I started on a drafting board. The advantage we have is we have PowerPoint and Excel. That's what we've come to. Now, I don't think that's a good way to do the design of, of smart factories or smart supply chains. It's just not the way to do it. And so I kind of think from analogy. That's kind of the way my brain works. And so um, my analogy, the thing that I aspire for us to be like is the semiconductor device designers. In 40 years, semiconductor device designers have increased the complexity of the things that they design by six orders of magnitude. 40 years ago, the leading semiconductor device would have a couple of thousand transistors in it. Today, 
we're, we're able to go out and buy semiconductor devices that have not 20,000, not 200,000, not 20 million or 200 million, but 20 billion transistors. Just think about that for a minute. 20 billion transistors, and they're all wired up together. So how many connections is that? A human being, in fact, a room full of human beings, a, a city full of human beings couldn't examine that design. It can't be done. We do it computationally. How is that possible? Because for something that's as complicated as a semiconductor device, if, if human beings can figure out how to design it correctly and build it computationally, why can't we do the same thing for the semiconductor factory? I think we ought to be able to. So what we need to understand is what made it possible. Well, what makes it possible is that there is a tool chain, a set of engineering tools that goes all the way from the initial description of what it is we want to have to the actual description of the physical device itself, the description that can be turned into machine instructions. Automatically, by the way. It's a tool chain. What made that tool chain possible is a really interesting story. When the De Department of Defense started buying semiconductor devices, someone realized that, you know, we're buying these semiconductor devices, which are wonderful. They make our weapons so spectacular compared to without. Um, so we got to have it. We're buying these devices from these little companies that we don't know if they're going to be around next year. So if they go out of business, we got these little pieces of plastic with metal sticking out of it. How do we get another one like it to replace it? How do we do that? Because all we got is the physical thing. And so DOD went to the semiconductor industry and said, you guys have got to give us a specification that we can give to someone else so they can build the same thing. You can imagine how excited they were about that. And so DOD went to a bunch of academics to get them to do it because we'll do anything for money. <laughs> and they did. They created something that's called the Very High Speed Integrated Circuit Hardware Description Language. It's a formal language for describing semiconductor devices actually describing them through their life cycle. From the functional specification of it to the schematic diagram to the physical realization. So VHDL, which DOD only wanted to document things, actually became the platform for creating tool chains. It not only created, it, one reason it created these tool chains is because once you have a standard representation you can hang off of that standard representation analyses. So nobody writes circuit simulations. You get that for free now because someone said, oh, I have this description. It's a standard description. I can write an interface to this, suck it into my analysis, my, my circuit simulation code, boom, I'm done. I never have to write another line of simulation code. I'm, I, I hear this and I think, oh my God, we spend a full semester teaching students how to do something that's obsolete, which is write simulation code. Nobody learns how to write circuit simulation code, or very few people do. It changes the nature of what people do in that business, and we should be doing the same thing in our business. What would it take? What would it take for us to be able to do that? Um, we need analysis agnostic system models. We need a hardware description language for the factory. And so we need, first of all, we need a language to do this with. We need systems engineering methodology, which we largely don't have. We need a domain specific hardware description language for our domain. We need model authoring and editing tools, CAD programs if you want, 
And we need integrated decision support analysis to help the people who are designing the artifact. In our case, designing the warehouse or the factory or the supply chain. That seems like a tall order. And, I, and I'm telling you, um, when it's been impossible until recently. In the last decade, it's become actually not insane to think that we could do this. Because there's a systems modeling language which is accessible to us. In my lab, we've been using this language since it, was, which is, since it first became a standard in 2007. Um, there are companies around the globe are adopting this language to do their systems engineering modeling. We're working with Boeing right now to, to use this language to help Boeing figure out not how to design airplanes because they're already using it for that, but how to design factories. So we have a language. That's not a problem. Check mark. Um, systems engineering methodology. There's a perfectly good systems engineering methodology that we can borrow. Dassault System has been promoting this for years, and many of the aerospace companies already use this in the designing of their airplanes. It's called RFLP. It stands for Requirements, Functional, Logical, Physical. It's the way they think about designing an airplane. And we can do exactly the same thing for designing a factory or designing a supply chain. For a factory, the requirement is the bill of materials and the production ramp. Functional is what are the capabilities that the factory has to have. Look at the products and see what functional capabilities are required to produce those products. Logical is organizing those functions into some logical architecture so that when you get ready to do the physical, you take those, those logical organizations and you populate them with specific resources. So this is a perfectly legitimate way to do factory design. In fact, that's the way Boeing is doing factory design. Requirements, we can specify, we can use our systems modeling language to specify requirements. Uh, functions, we can use our systems modeling language to specify functional requirements. Uh, logical, we can use our systems modeling language to specify not only the organization of resources, but what capabilities each resource has to have in terms of the processes that have to be executed to produce the product. So we have a lot of, of this in place. Physical, we can take our systems modeling language and we can, we can display how things are organized and how they're connected. Um, we're well on our way to creating a useful domain-specific language for modeling factories. For doing the same thing for supply chains is not that much of a challenge. Um, and so it all starts around this notion of an analysis agnostic system models. They have lots of benefits. Um, it's, it can be used at multiple levels of abstraction, which, is, um, which lets you support the evolution of a system design. The graphical models are very easy to understand and the stakeholders can understand the graphical models pretty easily. Uh, they're a basis for agreement among the subject matter experts about whether or not we have this system described correctly. Because remember, there's multiple stakeholders. It's a foundation for developing analysis tools. One of the biggest challenges that we face in the in the domain of discrete logistics systems is if we need to build multiple analyses today, we have no way to guarantee that the modelers, each of the individual modeling teams, is in fact modeling the same system. So we're supporting decision makers who are going to make decisions about this system and we're not sure that all the analyses are actually consistent in terms of describing the same system. And it's a basis for automating decision support analysis. Um, there's some implications for us, obviously. Um, we need, well, in terms of authoring and editing tools, mm, the stuff that we've been using for the last 10 years is getting better, but it's not there yet. 
in terms of integrating decision support analyses, we've done some proof of concept demonstrations and we've done some bench top uh, work uh, with Boeing. Um, and we're, we're continuing to do that kind of thing. Not quite there yet. But to me, it seems pretty clear that there's a revolution in how we do this, which is just around the corner. I've only been saying that for about 30 years. Um, there's some implications for us. One is that in this domain, we need to become a lot more proficient in terms of things like ontologies and semantics than we are now. That, that is for us what algorithms was back in the 1980s and 90s. Algorithms, sorting, searching, that sort of stuff became the foundation for making optimization models run really fast. And so ontologies and semantics and language is the foundation for doing the kind of things that we need to be able to do now. In terms of teaching, we need to start teaching our students to be systems modelers as well as analysis modelers, and they're different, and we need to understand that. Um, in terms of practice, I think that this is not yet at the point where most people in practice are going to be impacted by it, but it's coming. It's, it's not necessarily here now, and the people who are playing in this right now are, tend to be the very large companies, not the small ones. But when they get moving on this, everybody's going to get sucked into it, just like happened with CAD back in the 70s. Um, what's worth paying attention to? Out of all this stuff that I've talked about, what's worth, paying, what's, what's worth it for you to pay attention to? Um, process modeling methodology. It's going to make a huge difference because we already know how to do it. And there's plenty of proof of that it works. Um, this ISO level three controller framework, there's a key, that's the key, or something like it, is the key to making operational management um, a more consistent, robust solution, something that is reusable and transferable. Um, analysis agnostic system modeling. I really feel strongly about this. Um, when corporations are doing strategic planning and they're putting together strategic teams to design a new factory or to develop a new product or to, to, to open a new supply chain, for us, for, the, for, for those of us who are in this room whose area of interest is, is supply chains and logistics, generally speaking, we'd better be able to talk a systems language because if all we can talk is an analysis language, if all we can talk is, well, we know how to design storage systems, if that's what we're, know, we're known for, they're not going to come to us first. They're going to come to us when the big decisions have been made and they need somebody to fill out the details. But if we want to be at the strategic table, we need to be able to talk in terms of systems. We need to be able to think in terms of analysis agnostic systems models. That's, a, that's going to be a big deal. And something that I haven't spent much time talking about, but it sort of is in the background here, is model to model transformation. How do we go from analysis agnostic system models, which are complete and at least somewhat formal, and automate the creation of, analy of analysis models that we want to help us make decisions about the thing that's being specified? So, your turn. Questions? Yes. So I work in aerospace and I know this exact problem because everyone always talks in PowerPoint. Um, but making things standard, our problem was always is that too much standardization or not enough. Because as soon as you write the standard, you know, your world changes and the standard is no longer valid. So how are you supposed flexible to deal with that? So I don't know what kind of standards you've had experience with. were these internal corporate standards? Yeah, all internal. Okay. I, that's, you know, someone says we're going to do it this way, and that comes out of their experience. It doesn't necessarily come out of let's look at the domain 
and figure out how we do things from a generic point of view. So I, I, I spent about 10 years sitting on um, the board of an organization that was heavily involved in standards. And I know what a painful process that is. And, and if, in, if I ever suggested that I wanted to turn this into a standard, um, I, I plead innocent, I don't want to do that. What I'm interested in is how do we think about these things in a way that we can share that understanding and that thinking. If we can get to there, then building a, a quote standard language, I don't know if you call it a standard language, I would just call it a domain specific language that's usable across corporate environments. So um, aerospace manufacturing, let's, let's take that. I would be really happy if we had a domain specific language that we could use to go into the, the composite wing factory in McIltio and, and create an agnostic, analysis agnostic model of that. And then we could go down to Fort Worth and go into the F-35 plant and do the same thing. Because we're using common terminology, we have libraries of modeling objects that are reusable. That's the kind of thing that I think we need to be shooting for. Standardizing is a strong word. Well, with Boeing, like I said, we're, we're um, working with them. To, actually, what we're doing is we're putting together a, a playbook that says if you wanted to use the systems modeling language to specify the CWC, here's the process you would go through. So we're literally building models of the composite wing factory. So that's the Boeing project. Um, I have a project with NIST that is um, wrapping up this summer. And that project is essentially on, can we take this, this framework for um, operations management and actually demonstrate it? And so the case that we're using, the demonstration case that we're using is a large uh, central fill pharmacy. Central fill pharmacy is a very highly automated system dispensing maybe 2,000, 2,500 different drugs, uh, filling maybe 20,000 or 30,000 orders a day that are being shipped overnight to 250 to 800 different pharmacies. And so it's highly automated. And, and I keep saying this and I know it sounds crazy, but the control system is totally ad hoc. It's generally speaking what the controls engineers could figure out to make work. And so what we're doing is we've, we're building an analysis agnostic model of the central field pharmacy. We're building a simulation model, very painful, um, because what we need to be able to do is to separate the simulation of the processes of filling the vials and capping them and verifying them and bagging them from the process of controlling. And those of you who've taken the simulation language, um, just think about this. We need to be able to go off and do an analysis that says, which batch of orders should we release next? That is almost impossible to do in languages like Simio. In any logic, it might not be so bad, but that's not what we generally teach. We're using uh, SimEvents, which is a mat MathWorks product. So there's, there's the central field pharmacy stuff for NIST, there's the sort of the theory of um, operations management work with NIST, there's this project with Boeing. In the past we've done projects with Rockwell. Uh, we haven't, we're, we're involved in the Encozy and Encozy challenge team uh, and Collins Aerospace is a part of that team basically looking at how do we do systems modeling for electronics assembly. So there's a lot of work going on right now. Question. Yes. What's your opinion on um, process mining in place to build these models using actual transaction? So 
if, so I have to say, first of all, caveat, I'm not sure I understand the question, but if, but if, if let me sort, sort of give you an answer. Um, if what you're saying is taking transactions data and trying to build a process model, trying to understand a, a process better, I think that's fabulous. That's exactly what TSMC has done, is they built those, those data-driven process models. But data-driven process models and control models are not the same thing, right? So I need to have a process model that explains if this is the input, what's the output going to be? And then I need to be able to control that. So I think anything, any methodology, you know, it could be magic, I don't care, but any methodology that lets us get better process models, models that more correctly tell us what the output's going to be for a given input, that's a great thing. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity for research. Does that Yes. Number of times that you can pass your use for the same output. Right. And then now the question is, what do you do with it? You've got this. This tool has extracted some feature of your system for you. What do you do with it? That's the next step. And that's the okay. Someone's gonna have to make a decision. Are we gonna do things differently? because now we see something that we didn't see before. I'm a big fan of anything that collects the information and turns, collects the data and turns it into digestible, consumable information. Yes? Are, are you working with any transportation or supply chain companies? You mentioned the manufacturers. I, mean, I, I can tell you, spending many, many years like yourself in the, in the supply chain industry, as a transportation company, we were brought in after all that analysis, after Boeing, we've been on Boeing Field in a great place, a lot of it. And, and we said that we can't ship it that way. Yeah. And they were stunned. Yeah. And made an assumption. Well, so they're also stunned when they start to ramp up a factory and find out that they don't have enough capacity to move stuff around on the factory floor, right? Because all this stuff, the, 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 the white space in, in between the value adding operations gets ignored until the last minute. Well, that's why you need an analysis agnostic system model is so that you can figure out, oh, wait a minute, we've got a lot of white space we've got to fill in. And it's just not obvious and it, because of the way we've done things in the past. In terms of have we worked with any supply chain companies? Um, not in a long time. We did some stuff with GE way back that was essentially supply chain for wind turbines, but not so much lately. Yes, Andy. You're welcome. I always enjoy dry sense of humor and little innuendos that maybe not everybody caught. I thought they were hilarious. Um, so, so what's your opinion about what will be the linchpin in order for manufacturers to take on this more formalized approach? It almost seems like manufacturers are going backward and they're trying to cut every piece of sophisticated analysis tools out, or not tools, but people out of their process to save money. When do you think this will finally flip over and people say, oh yes, this is important? So, I, I don't know if there's a really good answer to that, um, but here's, here's something to think about. Manufacturers are becoming um, almost religious about um, eliminating waste, right? Um, doing things that 
improve local operations, take cost out of the system. That's, that's by itself not a bad thing. But here's a prediction. When you take all that waste out of the system, what you're also doing is you're taking all the slack out of the system. And when you've taken all the slack out of the system, when problems happen, they can be really bad problems, like we don't have any material, and so we can't do anything, or other kinds of things like that. And so when, when that happens, someone's going to say, well, how do we make that decision? And now you're back into decision space of saying, well, how do we make these decisions? Well, these are big, complicated systems. You know, when you have, you go into a wafer fab, you can have a thousand different tools, a thousand different tools, 4,000 jobs in progress at any one time. That's a really complicated thing. The thing that saves them is that they do it exactly the same way year after year after year after year. In fact, I just had a, uh, finished, uh, had a correspondence with a guy from Intel, and he said, you know, we regenerate our factory simulation every 15 minutes. And, and I said, yep, and you're the only people on the planet who do because for the last 40 years, you've had a team of people, a team, team, big team of people working on this, and it works for you. It won't work for Infineon. It'll only work for you. So it's not a, gen it's not a reusable kind of a solution. The answer to the question is, you have to get to a place where it's important enough that you make good decisions. Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you.